Hello, welcome to the Swindon Spring Festival. and We hope that all is well where you are. Now, we had hoped to be presenting live events in theatres, libraries and parks in May in Swindon, but that nasty little virus and the restrictions to try to contain it means we can now only have a virtual festival. And part of the virtual festival is this virtual session on the book, Who Owns England? How We Lost Our Land and How to Take It Back, whose author says this, land ownership remains our oldest, darkest and best kept secret and goes on to say, concealing wealth is part and parcel of preserving it. Please join me in giving a Swindon Spring Festival welcome to the man who has read, thought, researched, and even trespassed a bit in order to try to unlock some of these secrets and to find a new and fairer way forward. Welcome, Guy Shrubsoul. Hello, <laughs> good to be here. <laughs> Thanks very much for inviting me to be part of this, and I'm sorry, obviously, that we can't meet in person. No, we too are sorry that we can't meet in person. You can't be here in Swindon in May when we have a very good time at Lower Shore Farm, the, the festival's HQ, and uh, we chat about all sorts of things as well as what we do in the theatre. Um, talking of which, have you ever been to Swindon? I have been to Swindon. Uh, it was actually en route to go to the uh, uh, midsummer uh, solstice festival that is often held, well, it's held every year, in fact, of course, in Avebury. Um, so, yeah, it was nice to, to see Swindon and, uh, and head on to Avebury and see the people at the Stone Circle. Well, just like our festival, that live, those live ceremonies at Avebury and uh, Stonehenge have been cancelled this year for the first time, not this century, but in hundreds and even thousands of years. <laughs> so, so there you are. Um, but uh, thankfully we have this virtual way of doing things. Um, okay, now to your book, Guy. Um, Who Owns England? It has a great quote on the fly, fly leaf from no, the poet Norman McKay. He says, who owns the land? The man who bought it or I? who am possessed by it. Now, while being both informative and even entertaining, your book is also quite disturbing. And it seems to me it took some bother to write. And I wondered, why didn't you just content yourself, I don't know, with a simple job, writing romantic novels or genteel <laughs> book reviews? Guy, what made you care about who owns what land? Yes, well, I think it's something that goes back to my childhood in some regard. Um, I grew up in uh, a little town of Newbury, uh, which is not so far from Swindon, I guess. Uh, it was uh, when I was growing up there, um, the Newbury Bypass was being built through nine miles of countryside um, just to the west of, of the town that I was growing up in. And, you know, I used to go for walks in that countryside when I was a kid. Uh, Mum and Dad took me for walks in the countryside. I'd go there and explore and see all this wonderful nature um, and wildlife. And trees and um, then along came Margaret Thatcher's government and said well, we're gonna put a giant road scheme through um, through this, this this land and then later I guess in life um, it, it got me thinking about the people who owned the land who allowed that to happen so many large estates who owned the land to the west of Newbury who allowed it to be built who you know, ended up you know basically going against what they had perhaps professed for many years, that they were the rightful stewards of the land, that they instead were very happy to give in for profit and to see it tarmacked. Um, and it got me thinking, and later on in life, I started exploring land ownership, um, thinking about how we use land, but then also who owns it and how that determines to a large extent how it's used. And I started to discover how few uh, people owned the place that I'd grown up in, that actually only about 30 landowners owned half the entire county of West Berkshire. Um, you know, I'd known that it was quite a well-to-do, well-off place when I was growing up there. I was lucky to grow up in a kind of leafy part of the country, but I didn't know quite how wealthy some of these people were and quite how much land they controlled. So that was a real eye-opener uh, eye for me. And then as I looked further, I guess I started to realise how difficult it was to uncover who owns land. And it really is, I think, this, this dark secret that we still have. Uh, and that got me just interested because if I couldn't find out easily the answer to this 
really quite basic, simple question of who owns England, then I really, really wanted to find out why someone somewhere didn't want me to find out the answer to that question. Um, and, and, and that's interesting, isn't it? Because um, you, there you were in Berkshire and you mentioned Greenham Common um, and the military's use of the common. Um, and what, what, I mean, it happened slightly before your time, but what bothered you about that? Because really they would say that they were doing it for the good of the people. They were bringing cruise missiles to protect the land for the people, uh, part of an elected government. So wasn't it part of a democratic system that a piece of land is used to protect the people? Well, I mean, my parents held hands around the Green Common Air Base during the 1980s protests against the nuclear missiles being stored there. And I guess uh, I have always felt that, um, you know, the possession of nuclear missiles has been a pretty, pretty abhor abhorrent thing. Um, we need to get rid of them all. But um, I suppose that is slightly tangential to the question of land. But I do think actually it intersects with the question of land in the case of Green Common, because obviously, as the name suggests, it has uh, always been a common. Um, but here was the, you know, the great military machine of the UK state taking it on and closing it, fencing it off, not allowing people to use it for what it had previously been, which was, of course, you know, common land. Where people could graze their cattle in days gone by and um, people could access ordinarily. And so it was great to see eventually the fences come down, the nuclear missiles be taken away and people to be allowed to go freely onto the common again. And I spent many days, uh, you know, when I was a kid and living, growing up in Newbury, exploring the common and seeing the wildlife come back. So that was, that was great to see the, see the, the shoots gr growing up through the old rubble of the, uh, of the runways where previously bombers and uh, you know, air, air, aircraft had, had landed. Yeah, I mean, and we'll come back to this point of local people owning or having some ownership in local land, which is really the way your book ends. Uh, that's not a spoiler, it's just a, it's just a point. Um, but you also stay in trying to uncover who owns what, which proved to be quite a detective, detective story, as the more you found out, the more it made your blood boil. Um, why? Because aren't there really nice people with posh accents who look after land and look after and let people work on it and so on? Isn't it all an, an amicable English we don't want a revolution, do we? It's an amical English arrangement, isn't it, Guy? Or what? Why did it make your blood boil? I think it made my blood boil because I started to see uh, another facet to inequality in this country. And, um, and I, think, I think you're right that, that England is in many ways quite small C conservative. We haven't had a revolution, or at least we tell ourselves that we haven't had a revolution. We probably did have a revolution during uh, what is now called the Civil War. Um, we cut off the king's head and, and there were some forms of land reform at the time. But I don't think I am advocating a revolution, uh, at least if not, not, a, not one of the kind of pitchforks and peasants variety. Um, I think what I'm really taking aim at here is, and I think you know, uh, others have talked about this, that it is, it is not about the individual landowners who, many of them, of, many landowners are of course wonderful people and I think see wonderful stuff going on whether that's uh, you know, nature-friendly farming or uh, people trying to rewild some of their estates like the Nepp estate down in Sussex is doing. But I think there is a system around land ownership that has grown up, particularly English one, which, um, which sees ownership of land as being absolute, that um, it, it's, it's something where uh, land is, is owned to the exclusion of others. So fencing people, uh, fencing people off of commons or enclosing it or, or indeed uh, you know, having the, the entire law of trespass, which is, is obviously intended to exclude others from sharing in, in that land. Or, or using land in a way that um, allows people to destroy it, um, allows people to actually, you know, to, to ignore the, the wider public benefits of that land for, you know, sustaining us, for, uh, for, for, for managing the climate, for locking up carbon, for providing us with all the wonderful um, species that obviously sustain us all. And I think I, that's the kind of thing that I really wanted to, to start to kind of get my head around and to advocate for reform. And actually, uh, there are many people who we would now consider to be kind of pillars of the establishment, like, like Winston Churchill, for example, who in their day advocated land reform. Uh, 
Uh, and I think he, he talked, uh, when he was uh, writing about this 100 years ago, he was writing about how he didn't hate the individual, but he hated the system. Mm. Uh, and he wanted to see radical changes to the way in which land was valued and taxed and how it would um, you know, benefit more of the community rather than just the landowners. Uh, and I mean, but he didn't actually do anything about it. The last time there was talk of a land reform, what was it? The turn of the, uh, of the last century, 1909 or something, wasn't well, it? He he, he he did do quite a lot about it. He tried, and, and so did the Prime Minister at the time, Lloyd George. So two of uh, the greatest statesmen I think we probably had um, who, who were in, engaged in really radical land reform, as you say, 100 years ago, around 1909, there was the People's Budget, um, which brought in many um, aspects of the welfare state that we know and, and love today. But it also tried to raise funds to be able to fund the welfare state um, by uh, taxing land and taxing uh, the landowners and, and the landowners who were at the time even more uh, powerful and owned even more land than they do today. And I guess perhaps it might be relevant to us when we're thinking now about you know, our you know, era of coronavirus where we've you know, seen the, the, the value and the importance of things like the NHS and um, the state to be able to support people in times of need. And now obviously the state is saddled with huge amounts of debt once again, having to be able to pay for that well, they could start looking at things like land value tax as one way to fund that. I think that would be a good way to start thinking uh, going forward. Um, so, so do you think it's a political thing? For example, would somebody say about you, ah, oh, he's a socialist, he, 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 wants, he, wants, he wants it all shared out, um, and that's not what we voted for. We voted for the people who got a lot of money will make a bit more money and the other people will help them make a bit more money, and that's the way it is. I mean, what I'm really saying is, is this a deep-rooted political issue? I can't uh, claim to be anything other than probably of the left, you know, left wing, but, but equally I do think that land is one of those wonderful issues that crosses parties and crosses political divides. It's in some ways the great forgotten issue of English and British politics, and as I say, uh, you know, liberals and then subsequently conservatives like Winston Churchill, and Lloyd George in their day were great advocates of land reform. And I think we've also seen that more recently where it's something where actually many, uh, many people across the part, different political parties have seen the importance of land, started to realise again that it's fundamental to everything really it comes back to, you know, it underpins um, the housing crisis, it underpins the climate and ecological crises that we face. And I think we're starting to see and under an awareness, uh, again, across parties uh, during uh, the lockdown, the access to land and to green space is, is vital and it's something that needs to be um, addressed. Uh, few parties have ever picked, really tried to grasp the nettle of it, but when they have, I think they've started to see uh, how, how it underpins many of the social problems and crises that we face. And I hope that there would be that recognition today, that it is something that's not just simply the politics of envy, as some people try and uh, a, a kind of that swat it away as being, and that actually it's about um, something that we all have in, you know, we all share in common, that land is fundamental to who we are um, as a country and, and, and to our wealth. Uh, and indeed, people who voted, for example, for Brexit, voted for a slogan that included the words, let's take back control. Uh, land is so fundamental to a control and, and our control over our own lives that I would hope that it's something that unites people of, of all political persuasions, that's something we can get behind. Fantastic guy. Uh, and that, again, is addressing something that comes towards the end of your book. Um, I'd like to go back a little bit into an earlier part of your book. Now we've mentioned politics a bit, and, and that is the class structure in, in England. And, and I emphasise, by, by the way, Guy says this is about land in England. It's different in the other places. So we'll keep saying England, not the UK. Um, and in your, in your list, what you were able to find out, you weren't able to find out about 17% of the land, but you did find out that what you call the aristocracy and the gentry own 30% of the land in England, and that house owners, which you might call the ordinary man and woman on the street, own 5%. Um, so the aristocracy and the, 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 this, uh, this particular class own 30%. And, um, uh, and you say the very upper or aristocratic class contrived to own great swathes of England. Um, the role of violence in acquisition of their land is seldom acknowledged today 
in the placid displays you see in their country mansions, to which they sometimes let people go. And um, while you're thinking about an answer to that, I want to tell the, the, the viewers about a, a great little, it's like a little poem uh, that Guy has, a very short dialogue, um, but my imagination expanded it into a story which would go something like this. A farm laborer goes poaching and the owner of the land, a big posh burly man comes out and says, I say young man, what are you doing here? And this is my land. And the farm laborer replies, um, why is it your land? And the landowner says, because my father gave it to me. I inherited it from my father. And the farm laborer says, um, but how did your father get it? And the landowner says, he inherited it from his ancestors, of course, quite authoritatively. And the laborer says, the poacher laborer says, but um, how did they get it? And the landowner says, huh, they fought for it. They fought for it. Oh, says the poacher laborer, taking off his jacket. Um, can I fight you for it? <laughs> and it makes such a great point. Um, and how far back do we go with these things? Land acquisition, the fairness of it. Um, where's the cutoff point, if anywhere? Well, I mean, I think that story exactly exemplifies how uh, perfectly, how, how deeply rooted some of these structures are in the system of land ownership that we have. And, you know, as you alluded to, it goes back, in fact, to the Norman Conquest, um, that many of the, so when, when the William the Conqueror came over, uh, conquered England, um, he, for the first time, vested uh, all ownership of land in England to the crown, to himself and the institution of the crown, in order to be able to then parcel it out to barons and the church uh, as a kind of essentially a main means of patronage. Um, uh, and so that the barons would be loyal to him because they owed their land to him. And equally, he would be able to, do it, to call on them to be able to fight and wage wars and, and collect taxes and so on. And, you know, many of those barons, uh, their families, their descendants still own land today. So you have the Groveners, for example, uh, who the, the Duke of Westminster, as he is now known, uh, one of the always consistently at the top of the Sunday Times rich list um, because of the property empire that he owns based upon land that he has inherited down through the generations. Uh, he, his ancestors came over the Norman Conquest. His name, the name Grosvenor, in fact, derives from, a, um, from uh, originally Le Grand Veneur, the great hunter, who peasants, I think it, it, the story goes, back in the day, decided to call him the fat hunter or le gros veneur instead. So all these things go back. And I guess, again, the point is not to necessarily single out individuals like, you know, the, the Duke of Westminster, but to say they point to this deeper structure, the, uh, as you say, of class, of uh, inheritance, of wealth and so on. But I think um, talking about also the, the, the violence inherent in the system, as Monty Python put it in, um, you know, the, the, the Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there is a serious point there, which is that, uh, it's not to say that um, at all that it is right, it's completely wrong to, of course, for, for land to have been stolen and, to, uh, and for that to be the means by which people have been dispossessed over the centuries. I mean, the acts of enclosure, of the commons, the original conquest, the ill-gotten gains from slavery, which paid for many of these larger states as well. Um, clearly that's wrong and that has left a stain, I think, on, uh, on, on claims to owning land outright. Um, I guess the question is, is, well, how do we start to write that? Do we just sort of wring our hands about these past misdemeanors? Clearly, you can't blame current generations for having done that. But I think hopefully what it does is to highlight the greater social responsibility that landowners should feel, I think, um, when thinking about the land that they own today. <clears throat> and, um, you know, when, when talking about things like uh, landowners being the rightful custodians of the countryside or stewards of the countryside, that that really has to have a meaning. Um, that has to ha that has to be something that's felt and is kind of um, paid attention to. Um, and that I think I hope also that a larger number of uh, more more of the public starts to take an interest in land once again and starts to sort of hold some of those 
claims of stewardship, rightful, rightful ownership and stewardship to account because, um, because so few people own the land uh, and because it is so fundamental to everything that we need and from food to housing to, to, you know, to regulating the climate and so on, that we all do have an interest in it. And so we have to work with landowners, hold them to account, question whether those systems are the right ones. Um, and I think that's where you know, we need to be paying attention to land once again and care about who owns England and care about how it's, that land is used. I mean, um, it's so true, isn't it? Uh, what's that Mark Twain quote that you say? Um, land is the best investment because they don't make it anymore. Exactly, yes. And yeah. It's a better investment even than a house. Uh, um, and um, if a Martian looked down on us and said, you know, this is an amazing planet you have here, how do you share it out? And discovered that it was shared out the way you describe, um, they might be a little bit alarmed, especially because we claim civilized and that we care about one another. And, and a Martian might say, do you know what? That's quite animalistic what you're doing. You're grabbing what you can and building high walls and saying, this is mine, which is exactly why birds sing in the morning to claim their territory and so on. Mm. And here we are saying we're not animals and we're still doing it. Guy, I wonder if you would, um, in a minute, um, after I have said, Guy's book has brilliant chapter headings, um, very informative, England's Darkest Secret, The Establishment, Crown and Church, Old Money, New Money, Corporate Capture, A Property, a, a property Owning Democracy, and so on, A Trust for Tomorrow. Um, can we see what your book looks like? And when you're doing that, when you're showing us, because we do judge a book by its cover, could you also talk about um, these percentages that I've mentioned um, of ownership? And you weren't able to find out about 17% from the land registry. And maybe you could say a little bit about the percentage of ownership, which I found absolutely fascinating and full of surprises, uh, and, and some not at all surprising. And then also um, uh, why the land registry will only reveal um, who owns one third of England. To, to an ordinary person like, like, like me or someone else, and not two thirds, not the other two thirds. What's going on? Percentages, ownership, and book cover, please. <laughs> yes, of course. So here is the book cover of Who Owns England. This is the hardback edition. You can see uh, some nice barbed wire on the front here that's been severed. Um, uh, I'm very glad they included that on the cover. Um, there's a story actually that and I won't go into it in great detail involving me trying to climb over some barbed wire fencing to go trespassing uh, and uh, coming a bit of a cropper. So perhaps that serves me right. But, um, but yes, I think that kind of uh, encapsulates uh, much of the countryside, incredibly beautiful, um, wonderful to, to look at and to go walking in. Uh, but for much of it also fenced off, surrounded by keep out signs and so on. Um, but to talk a little bit about, some of the percentages, yes, and who owns land. So obviously a lot of it remains opaque and difficult to um, get a handle on. Um, but where I got to in researching this book and, and coming to some conclusions about it was that 1% of the population own half the land in England, which is quite staggering really in terms of that level of, of inequality, that concentration of ownership. And then when you start to break it down, looking at some of the different institutions and sorts of landowners. Um, we've mentioned already the aristocracy, and by my reckoning, the aristocracy and gentry, and this is only a few hundred or thousand, possibly a few thousand people, own about 30% of the land in England. Um, and again, many of them have inherited that land down through the ages. There's a, a slightly a smaller group, but still very influential uh, and, and large landowners of what I, I call in the book new money, people who tend to have come into wealth and land in the last hundred years. Since the Industrial Revolution, they may have made their wealth um, in other ways. Um, so older landowners, their wealth tends to come from the land originally. More newer landowners who still own large amounts of land, but their wealth has perhaps come from banking. They might be uh, city bankers or from uh, other forms of business and so on. Reckon they own somewhere in the region of 18% uh, or so of land um, in England. Um, the, uh, the public sector, so we mentioned the Ministry of Defence earlier. So the Ministry of Defence, the vast estates of the Forestry Commission, um, the NHS, local authorities, 
um, and all other aspects of central government, um, actually own, only owns around 8% of England. And that has declined a lot in the last 30, 40 years or so since the onset of privatisation, first under Margaret Thatcher's government and more recently under austerity since 2008 or so, or 10. Um, so there's been a big decline. Um, homeowners, as we mentioned, only about 5% of the land in England. So we are told that we live in a property only democracy and that is one of the chapters I deal with talking about how um, you know, many more people, of course, today do have a stake in the country in the sense of owning property, owning a house. But if you look at it overall, actually the area of land that's taken up by homes and gardens actually only amounts to about 5% of England. So others besides include things like the National Trust, uh, some of the conservation bodies that have come to sort of own land to try and protect it and look after it for the long term. But again, they're not huge landowners actually compared to some of these aristocrats or overall. So there's about 2% of land in England is owned by the National Trust and some of the other conservation groups. Um, I'm now starting to forget where I've got to in terms of the overall total. And perhaps can you remind me of your, of your other question as well? Um, um, well, you've shown us the book. I've mentioned yes. the chapter headings and you're yes. talking about, uh, well, I, I said, why is it so hard to get ah, information yes. from the land registry? Why could you only get, or why can we only get one third of, yes. of, of England? Excellent. Why can we only know what happened about the other two thirds? I should just mention before we move on to that, the, the Crown yeah. and the Church, they are obviously very significant landowners still, um, but again, much diminished from what they were sort of in the medieval period. I wanted to mention them had you not gone to them, Guy, because yeah. I, I found it a real surprise because in dinner time conversations, people said, oh, the Crown own most of the country and oh, the Church, because of, you know, his historical claims on it, the Church owns 0.5 of a percent and the crown um, 1.4 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the National Trust, uh, which does, you know, uh, 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 as good a job as it can, only 2%. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's under 3% for those three big organizations that we think, you know, Indeed. own yeah. swathes of England. They don't and they are, of course, they are very significant landowners. We shouldn't uh, forget that and obviously, yeah trying to get a handle on what all this means. You know, if you imagine what an acre is, you may, people may not sort of have a sense in their minds of what an acre looks like. Um, it's about the size of Parliament Square, if you can envisage that. Um, uh, some people talk about it in terms of football fields and golf courses and so on, but I, I prefer that sort of image. Um, I, they're clearly the crown and as I said the crown and the church and, and, and so on have clearly dim diminished in size but I think they're fundamental to the system the structure of land ownership because they helped to set that level of concentration of land ownership from the outset so it was that at first that Norman system of patronage and feudalism that created it and the church that essentially gave its its sort of spiritual blessing to it um, and today of course they still do own hundreds of thousands of acres so the crown estate the duchies of Cornwall and Lancaster and the church commissioners, they're all very big landowners still, and they, we should definitely not let them off the hook just because they own much less than they once did. Um, but perhaps we should talk a little bit now about the, the why that we can't get access to more of this information. These are, some of those figures are, uh, you know, best calculations, best estimates in some cases, um, using proxy figures or other means to try and estimate what those, those institutions and, and owners own. But to be able to get to the real detail of it, to, to be actually able to map who owns land in this country, um, is still really, really difficult. And for 160 years, we've had a government body that's actually been set up to do this. It's called the Land Registry. And yet it still hasn't actually finished completing the task of registering all land, even after all that time. That's partly because it hasn't been uh, until more recently compulsory to register it um, when, uh, when it changes hands. Uh, and that points to the fact that actually a huge amount of land has not changed hands in the marketplace for hundreds of years. So, um, you know, many of these large aristocratic estates or the crown uh, may well own or have title to uh, unregistered land. And so they've never had to, because it's never left their hands, they've never had to register at the land registry. But even for the stuff that is registered, uh, it's still really hard to get a handle on that. Um, that's because um, the land registry charges uh, a fee for access to its information. Um, it charges three pounds for every, to find out who owns every field and house and, and property. And that may not sound very much uh, for just finding out who owns a field or who owns one house. Absolutely not. 
but there are 24 million land titles registered with the land registry. So if you do the maths, times that every one by three pounds, that's something around 72 million pounds that you'd have to pay out to find out who owns all of it. Um, yeah. So not having that sort of money to hand, I ended up looking in other ways, trying to use things like freedom of information requests to find out information from public bodies about what they owned or uh, a few other kind of workarounds. So there are certain, certain um, uh, other laws by which people sometimes uh, disclose um, maps of their estates uh, for reasons of kind of public access, protecting against future rights of way claims and so on. And so trying to piece that puzzle together has been, I guess, the kind of work of, that I've been trying to do over the last couple of years, a few years now. Uh, and that's what has gone into this book. Um, thanks for that, Guy. Um, um, we'll end by talking about your 10 point agenda for land reform in England. Um, but just before that, I wonder how, how your book has been received. It's been out for a while now, and um, you got into trouble in the book. Um, have, you, have, you, have you been in any kind of trouble um, since publication? Uh, have you been invited to, to estates for dine out, or have you, what's happened, Guy? I wouldn't say invited to estates to dine out. No, um, I, I think generally it's been pretty well received. i um, been very happy with, um, uh, how many people seem to have bought it and enjoyed it. Um, I think at last count there were about 10,000 sales of the book, so that was really, really encouraging to hear that the message is getting out and people are interested in this. Um, I was amused by some of the reviews that I got, uh, and my uh, particularly uh, proud of getting a one-star review in the Telegraph um, from none other than the former Environment Secretary Owen Patterson, who, um, you know, Let's say I've never seen particularly eye to eye with him. He was a bit of a climate skeptic when he was in government. And so I wasn't too disheartened to get that review. I think it may have actually helped boost sales. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to see the reaction. I think there are, there are, I was disappointed, I think, by some of the reactions from some on the right to, to the book, because I think they kind of uh, once again pigeonholed it as being something which is just about, oh, well, you just want to kind of come after my garden or, this is all just about garden taxes or you know, whatever and the sort of reductio ad absurdum of the politics of land to something about just one's own personal yeah. house garden. you know I, i'm very mild in some ways in the book about saying that actually i think everybody should have, be able to have you know access to land and be able to own a garden and, and a house and how that's a great thing to be able to aspire towards but i think what i've been reacting against is is really some of the unfairness that's crept in and and obviously from the outset but also particularly when we've got things like the housing crisis and we've got to deal with things like climate change and that requires us to change which really the way we use our land so um i've been encouraged by as i say by the number of people who've, who've just got in touch and just said how excited they are by it and how much they're starting to do their own thing campaigning investigating always getting offers of help people uh, writing to me and just sort of saying can i help out with more investigations and um that's just really encouraging and brilliant to hear yeah. I think it's a, it's a terrific title and so obvious and um, such an obvious question, not only for my generation, but for your generation and generations in between to ask because, you know, this expression, an Englishman's home is his castle and all this stuff implying that a bit of terra firma to stand on makes it feel better and not being able to do that mm. disempowers us and makes us feel Feel not as well, and it and it and it has to do with health and many other things. So it strikes me as a really important question and a kind of really welcome question. And I think, goodness, why have I never seen a book with that title before? Why have we all made so many assumptions? And I find passages in it to read out at meal times again and again. So it's great for that. But look, we're coming to the end of our time, but we have still that a few a little while to chat, and so, somehow to end on a on a positive note of what what can we do about it? Um, and it's not all bad. There's a, there are a lot of good things, as you've said, you know, people who own thousands of acres are also making very good use of it. So this is this book does not, by the way, folks, criticize everybody who owns more than a pocket handkerchief garden. Absolutely not. Um, it's, it's, it's very balanced in that sense. But towards the end of your book, on page 271, you come to a suggested 10 point agenda for land reform in England. And it includes at number eight, we haven't got time to go through all of them, but so we'll just look at one of these points. At number eight, you say, give people a stake in the country and let local communities take back control of local land. Mm. 
How would that work, Guy? Mm. Yeah, well, and very, very uh, relevant, I think, to what we were mentioning earlier about Brexit. But in Scotland, um, there is and has been since 2003 something called a community right to buy. And this allows any community that forms a um, properly constituted democratic organisation, uh, a community group, um, to be able to bid for uh, a right to buy land or, uh, or, or properties in, in their area um, that come up for sale. And um, you might say, well, obviously we can do that anyway. Um, the change, the very slight change to the law that um, has been introduced in Scotland that makes it better and easier for communities to be able to do this is that it gives the community group a first right to refusal when uh, such a piece of land or, or, or community asset comes up for sale. And, and, and also it gives them access to um, be able to bid into a public fund, that the Scottish government runs. And this is crucial because often, you know, if you're putting land on the market, um, you know, obviously the, the market uh, rules apply and obviously the first, first come kind of first serve in some respects and, you know, the, the land tends to obviously go to the highest bidder or uh, it will, um, it, it's very hard for a community group to get its act together in time to be able to you know, bid at the auction or, 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 or go to the land agent and, and talk to them about it in time. And so this essentially kind of just gives a little breathing period in which for a community group to come together, to get the money together, to raise the funds and to be able to um, put in a bid for this land. And it's led to some amazing things happening in Scotland. It's led to entire islands being bought back from absentee landlords who, that have been, uh, who have owned it for hundreds of, owned own those islands for hundreds of years. I visited, um, you know, I visited one island, uh, the Isle of Ulva, up off the west coast of Scotland, happened to be on the day uh, that the community had been successful in buying back that land. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know a huge amount about the current or the, the, the owner who had just preceded the community buy up, but certainly back in the day, Ulva had been a thriving community and had hundreds of people living on it and um, farming and so on. And by, and today it has six people left on it. Uh, because of things like the enclosure movement back in the day, the Highland, clear, Highland and Island clearances, um, and, and it became completely depopulated and just not a viable economy anymore. And so what they're trying to do now is, is to rejuvenate that community, is, is to genuinely take back control of um, you know, access to land and to, to its resources um, for the people of that island. And I think that that's something that could be equally applied in other parts of the UK, in England, uh, to to really rejuvenate things like the dying high street, or to you know to to take on pubs that have gone out of um, and out of use, uh, but that others in the community want to see them brought back, or or indeed to more widely to to buy land that um, a community depends upon. You know there are places in uh, in, in West Yorkshire like, like Hebden Bridge and Todmorden, for example, who are effectively at the mercy of um, landowners who own land upstream from them. And that every, uh, every winter now, or even more frequently, um, given climate change, they're seeing huge amounts of uh, flood water come off the moors that uh, lie at the head of the valleys and flood people's homes. And, uh, you know, if only that communities in those areas were actually allowed to have more control over those bits of, bits of land, perhaps to buy them out eventually from the private um, grass moor estates who currently own them, I think that would be a great step forward and would allow those communities, uh, you know, greater control over their lives, essentially. So. Um, to me, that's a, that would be one thing I would love to see happen in England. I think it's an eminently sensible idea. It's been trialled already north of the border in Scotland. And uh, why can't we learn from that? No, and I've seen evidence on it on a small scale of people owning community woodland and so on. And in a way, it could almost be part of what that previous prime minister talked about, the big society, people taking care of, uh, of things. I, I, I agree with you. I think there's, there's, there's real possibilities. Maybe we'll have a in 2029 to St George's Hill, we'll have a new lot of diggers coming to show the people's will. <laughs> that would be brilliant. Um, that, that, and, and they will if they read the book, Who Owns England? Um, Guy, we have to stop there. Um, anyone who's watching, we hope you are keeping well on your little bit of land or your vast acreage. Whoever you are, we wish you well. Um, but most of all, we give a Swindon Spring Festival thank you uh, to Guy Shrubsall. Guy, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me much. Thank you for uh, watching this virtual session at the Swindon Spring Festival of Literature and the Arts 2020. We do hope you enjoyed it and we also hope that you will join us for the rest of this virtual festival. <laughs>
Here for you are details of the author you have just watched, their book, and our online information. Thank you very much for joining us and keep well till we meet again. Thank you.